Thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us this evening for the second installment of the School of Public Health seminar series on the intersection between climate and health. Brown School of Public Health always takes on the more complicated issues and the tougher issues of our day. We look at substance use disorder, violence prevention, gun violence, pandemic response, information disorders. We, we like to take on the tough challenges. Climate change is another area where we are leading to understand and respond to issues that are impacting health and well-being of our communities locally, nationwide, and worldwide. Last month, we explored the associations between climate change and infectious diseases. Colleagues shared how their research helped us understand how climate change impacts the transmission of diseases and what we can do to minimize and prepare for those impacts and challenges. This month, we're looking at how extreme weather is impacting our health and well-being. Climate change is leading to rising global average temperatures and more frequent or more intense extreme weather events, such as heat waves and large storms. In just the last two years, flooding in Pakistan in 2022, in June, saw a third of the nation inundated with heavy rain and killed more than 1,000 and impacted many, many more. In June 2021, we saw the most extreme heat wave in the world's history. The intense heat saw temperatures in Lytton, British Columbia, reach 121 Fahrenheit, and Kiliute in Washington, state of Washington, reached 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which led to over 1,000 deaths in Canada and northwestern U.S. The summer of 2021 also saw summer monsoon flooding in India, which claimed nearly 1,300 lives and extreme floods in Europe, which killed 240 and caused over 20 billion in damages. Flooding in China the same year is reported to have been responsible for killing nearly 250 people damaging 1.4 million homes and businesses and causing $30 billion in damage, with one day in July seeing 25 inches of rain in just 24 hours, which is equivalent to an entire year's worth of rain in a single day. Wildfires are seen more frequently, with 2020 fires in Australia burning through more than 10 million hectares killing 28 people with millions more impacted by hazardous smoke haze, probably which the health effects are yet to be known. Hurricane Katrina, I'm sorry, um, in the U.S. over the past 22 years, there has been some uh, drought events in those, there's been serious drought events in those 18, 18 of those years. In that time period, we've also seen some of the worst hurricanes, including Hurricane Katrina, a Category 3 hurricane that hit Florida, southern Mississippi coastlines, Louisiana in, 20, in 2005, causing more storm surge damage and flooding, killing over 1,800 people. Hurricane Sandy hit the northeast and coast, and particularly New York and New Jersey in October 2012. The storm interrupted official water and electrical services in major population centers, and caused 159 deaths. Hurricane Harvey was a Category 4 hurricane that hit Texas in August of 2017, causing extreme rain and flooding that displaced over 30,000 people, damaged or destroyed over 200,000 homes and businesses, and killed 89 others. Hurricane Maria was a Category 4 or 5 storm that hit southeast Puerto Rico in September 2017, it caused widespread flooding and landslides, as well as heavy winds that caused extensive damage, including the loss of nearly 3,000 lives from the storm and its aftermath. Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana, also a Category 4, category four storm, in August of 2021, where winds of over 150 miles per hour caused severe damage before it merged with another weather system and caused flooding across Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. Currently, the Biden administration has recognized the rising economic cost of extreme weather events, but we are still reckoning the cost to our health and well-being. Well, this is what we're here to discuss today. In this seminar, we will hear about the, 
how clinicians are starting to see the impacts of extreme weather on our population here in Rhode Island, where we are seeing increased temperatures, rain, flooding, and sea level rise. We will hear about how health systems are learning from past events to adapt, how they will work to support people with health conditions and disabilities through extreme weather events. And we will hear how these kinds of events are impacting human behavior and forcing short and long-term migration. With today's panel chaired by our own Stephanie Friedhoff, co-founder and director of the Information Futures Lab, we will also hear how we need to improve communications engagement with communities to help with to help us to prepare to respond to the ongoing I mean to the ongoing and growing volume of extreme weather events. Thank you again for joining us for the second of these exciting and insightful insights. And if you're here for the first one, um, you probably have really big expectations for this one. <laughs> so thank you Stephanie and we welcome the panel. Thank you, Ron, for the fantastic introduction. Way to bring up the pressure here for us. Um, it's fantastic to have you all here in the room. Uh, everybody on the live stream, I know there was a lot of interest in this event today. I do need to start by thanking Emily Howe, who is the brain behind all of this. Thank you, Emily, for bringing this important issue into our conversations, into our days. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Um, I promise we did a lot of prep work. Hope we didn't prep the color coding of the panel, but it works really well. <laughs> it's fantastic uh, uh, for me to be able to introduce you to these three thinkers, leaders, researchers, practitioners. We're going to talk about how, how we better understand the impact of climate change and health, but also how it impacts all of us and what we can do about it today. So... Um, let me introduce the panelists to you. We have right here uh, Dr. Kate Moretti, who is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Brown University. And she researches uh, the health implications of climate change, specifically heat and heat island effects, and the contributions of healthcare to the climate crisis. She founded and currently co chairs the Rhode Island Medical Society Climate Change and Health Committee. We also have Mary Cruz Rivera Hernandez, who's an assistant professor of health services policy and practices at Brown School of Public Health. Mary Cruz has an interest in improving health and healthcare for disadvantaged minority elders through policy relevant research. And she is currently engaged in the long term effects of Hurricane Maria on healthcare delivery, migration, and mortality among people with kidney failure in Puerto Rico, among many other things. And then we have Elizabeth Beth Fussell, who's Professor of Population Studies and Environment and Society. Beth is a sociologist and demographer, and her work focuses on the societal and environmental causes of migration and population change. Her research explores the effects of extreme weather events on migration system, systems and population health in the US, and we'll talk a, a bit and a lot more about that. So, Kate, let's start with you. You are an emergency room phys physician. How are you seeing the impacts of extreme weather in your day to day? I'm not technically savvy. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm an emergency physician uh, at Rhode Island Hospital and at Miriam as well. And I think if you um, think about how this is affecting emergency physicians and clinicians, if you think nationwide, we're seeing increasing rates of disasters that affects our day to day. So nationally, if you think just this last year, wildfires were huge out west, flooding down south, um, with increasing frequency, leading to increasing emergency visits. Um, and then here, uh, primarily what we're seeing in Rhode Island are extremes of weather. So heat extremes and then these huge cold snaps that come in and affect primarily our most vulnerable populations. And when we think about these disasters, we think about the initial direct effects of them. So in a hurricane, somebody drowns or there's trauma from a building falling down. And that's what we always think about. But then we're also seeing all of these secondary effects that comes from people not being able to get their medications, people not being able to get to their physicians, not being able to access dialysis, 
um, not being able to get their scheduled surgeries or their chemotherapy. Um, so all of these secondary effects. And then after that, we're seeing tertiary effects where our healthcare systems themselves are affected. So people can't get to the hospitals, roads are flooded, et cetera, nationwide. Um, and these are leading kind of all to these secondary effects. In our region, in Rhode Island, and also in Massachusetts, we're also seeing with these extreme weather um, or extreme temperatures, it puts more pressure on the healthcare system themselves and the grids. And we're seeing some um, power outages and those outages and those sorts of things that affect health. Thank you so much. Um, Mary Cruz, that is very close. Well, the introduction we just got is very close to the work that you do also. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your research in Puerto Rico and what we can learn about this direct impacts of, of climate change on how people access health, how they're able to access care, and then how that impacts their overall um, health? Um, so, um Before um, Maria happened, um, we have been doing a lot of research related to healthcare access and utilization in Puerto Rico. I'm very familiar with the area. Um, and uh, because I'm interested in the Medicare, Medicare population there. So we were looking at mortality trends for people with kidney failure right before Maria. And we noticed that mortality was higher for people in Puerto Rico compared to Hispanic Medicare beneficiaries here in the USA. So ran around the time then after we found that Maria happened, and we uh, were very interested in, in understanding whether uh, Maria actually caused um, even higher mortality rates for this population that is already very vulnerable there. So um, we were looking at the data um, and actually found that our mortality was not as high as we expected after the hurricane. So um, I became very interested in understanding um, what were pro providers and physicians doing there in Puerto Rico to, um, to, to, um, to take care of, of, of dialysis patients. Because as it was mentioned, um, in Maria caused a lot of damage. There was no electrical power for a long time. Even after you know, a year of the Maria happened, many, many areas didn't have electrical power. Some hospitals were not running. Uh, some dialysis facilities were closed. Um, so all of that pointed that mortality was going to be higher um, than before. Um, so, um, so it seems like what, from um, preliminary collection and qualitative interviews that I'm doing with providers and physicians there, um, right after Katrina um, happened here in the U.S. mainland, CMS released some protocols that they wanted to um, have preparedness group to um, run protocols and plans in, and have plans in place to make sure that dialysis patients have access to care, providing pre-empty dialysis for people that, that, that were of immediate need um, and have directory of patients to access to the patients that were most in need uh, and be able to make sure that they were able to access any dialysis facility, regardless whether they was part of their network uh, based on insurance. Um, so they, you know, so they will have access to, to care, um, as well as making sure that they were able to access patients that didn't have transportation because roads were broke. Um, so, um, so these, these, these groups, this coalition meets regularly to prepare for these events in Puerto Rico. I'm not sure that this exists anywhere else. I have not gone through the process of, of um, identifying other, other groups around the US, but is uh, I was fascinated by meeting this coalition and talking to all the work that they are doing on a regular basis to make sure that with any disaster, these patients are taken care of. Um, one of the things that I found striking was that We didn't find the mortality increase, but we did find that there was a huge increase in uh, migration for these patients. A lot of people left Puerto Rico before and right after Maria, because if they didn't have access care to the island or people that were able to take them, you know, in front of the house, um, they came to the U.S. mainland to have access to social network and supports 
to have people that were able to take them to this dialysis, which probably help with um, good mortality rates. Um, so the efforts in Puerto Rico, as well as people in social networks here in the U.S., help to, uh, with you know, we believe the help with with the, the stabilized mortality rates for this population. Thank you, Mary Cruz. Um, a, a fantastic um, <coughs> insight into how how planning and organization helps in mitigating and adapting. Um, at the same time, it's complicated. And um, Beth, that leads us to you. Um, you have some personal experience and uh, do a lot of research on um, uh, on these connections and have been living and working in New Orleans when Katrina happened. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you experienced that and how that shaped your work. Yeah. Um, prior to Hurricane Katrina, I was a migration scholar and, and a demographer and sociologist, and my research was on Mexican migration to the United States. And um, that, you know, a demographer is interested in population composition and population change. And so the, the, the components of population change are fertility, mortality, and migration. So demography very much is a health-related uh, field. It's funded by NIH, but it mainly, um, it, it mainly thinks about the denominator. Who's exposed? You know, who is the population at risk? And with Hurricane Katrina, I had a front row seat to what happens when a catastrophic disaster occurs. Um, migration is, as opposed to what you all are studying with the direct health effects of heat or um, you know, the effects of, of the disruption on patients with chronic disease, Migration is more like a secondary effect that happens after the a disaster causes damage to the built environment. And I just want to remind people that a disaster mm -hmm. isn't actually the weather event itself. The disaster is that a disaster happens when a society and its institutions, its structures aren't able to cope with the weather event. And so when that, um, you know, in the United States, We've adapted our, our cities and our, and our, uh, any settlement area to the weather that it's most likely to experience. And we've adapted it to the kind of level at which those events are kind of normal. So we can typically cope with most weather, but with climate change, changes in weather systems are happening so quickly that we can't modify our built environment fast enough to keep up with the more destructive and, and frequent weather events. So what we saw in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina, and I was an assistant professor at Tulane when this happened, um, what we saw was that this city that was protected by a levee system uh, and was had coped with many, many hurricanes of the same strength, what the, it became a catastrophe when that protective infrastructure failed. And so that disaster was really that, com you know, it, it perfectly illustrated the way in which a disaster is the failure of the society to cope with the weather. And it affected, it, you know, it caused a failure of the healthcare system, a failure of the infrastructure, the housing, everything that people depend on to live from day to day. 80% of the city was flooded and some neighborhoods were flooded. The homes were flooded up to their rooftops. So the waters were 20 feet deep. Um, people were displaced initially there was mandatory evacuation. People were displaced by that evacuation, but the, the failure of infrastructure to pump the water out of the city meant that the water remained there for six weeks. And that was the earliest that people could come back to the city. And then for, uh, for many people, the damage and destruction of their, of their neighborhoods was so extreme that it was as, as much as a year or more before they were able to come back to even see their homes and their neighborhoods. 
So that was an extreme, dis an extreme disruption. <coughs> and this is where migration initially was an evacuation, then it became a prolonged displacement, and then for many people it turned into a permanent relocation. We've, and the effects of that are that people can't protect their health because all of their normal habits that are protective of their health, that give them access to health care and medicine, were disrupted by the displacement. And so we think of migration, I think of migration as a secondary effect of a disaster that can lead to this, uh, to this prolonged health impact because of the disruption to normal routines. I can, um, I could talk more about mental health, but I can also leave that for a, for a later question. Or for our next questions, yeah. Thank you for walking us through this. And I remember, um, especially right after Katrina, there was also such a vacuum for a couple of days with FEMA not responding and, and people just being in shock because Katrina was an event that the Army Corps of Engineers had predicted, right, would happen at some point. And still, uh, we, we didn't do those things to um, prepare. So we'll talk in a second a bit more about all the things we can individually and collectively do to prepare. But picking up a little bit, um, Mari Cruz, and, and on, on the things that all of you said, is let's start with really like, who are the mo who's most vulnerable to the impact here? Who do we need to be thinking about? Dialysis patients, right? Who would have, you know, other than a researcher who would have thought to think about you, we knew that the power went out, but we don't immediately think what happens to all the dialysis patients. Like, help us understand who all is really the most impacted right now by the types of events that we're seeing. So, yeah, so I start to think about all of the populations that can't come up with adaptive or mitigative strategies themselves. So, um, and, and these are the patients we see primarily in the emergency department. So it's our elderly that can't get out of their homes when they're really, really hot. They can't access alternative forms of care. They can't access transportation out. Are really, really young who don't have the physiologic capabilities to, to um, manage huge swings in temperatures or lack of regular nutrition or hydration, et cetera. And then all of these patients with chronic illnesses um, that rely on medications regularly, treatments regularly like dialysis or uh, electricity, so vent-dependent patients, patients that require CPAP or BiPAP at night are very, very at uh, risk for this, um, pulmonary patients. And we also think about anybody with chronic illnesses. Um, so. And, and think about how many people this is, right? So people with diabetes that need insulin, insulin needs to be refrigerated, right? And kept at a stable temperature. And when we lose access to that, they very quickly decompensate. Uh, our heart failure patients that require very strict balances of medications, um, anybody with underlying lung disorders so our COPD and our asthma patients are very susceptible to these disasters for many different reasons. So it compounds. A lot of times when we think about climate change, one of the things that makes it so difficult is that it's a threat magnifier, right? So it, it affects these patients at many, many different levels. And also these disaster comes on the background of another disaster, right? So they're one back to back. And now also we're in this world of COVID, which also complicates things further. So it just complicates things. So it's a huge number of people that are affected. So... Um, I can, you know, talk a little bit about the dialysis uh, population since this is the <coughs> that I'm doing right now. And, um, and Kate was mentioning all these other people with complex current conditions. The difference with dialysis patients is that, um, at least the population themselves, they have to go to a facility about three times a week. So they have constant communication with providers. Um, that if something like this happened, they can prepare and make a plan for, you know, do you have the medications that you need because, you know, this event is coming. Uh, while other patients may not have access to that. We, you know, there was um, um, mentioned here about someone with heart condition, right? Um, so if they are not seeing providers that often on a regular basis, 
those are the populations that might be that might be more at risk of something happening to them, right? Because they might not have access to these medications in place or a system in place or or a plan already set up for them to uh, have. You know, like do I need to leave the house at what point? My family around. Um, another population that I can think of is um, those that are uh, in institutional care, um, people in nursing homes. Um, David Dosa, the department. Uh, has some research going on to understand the effects for people that live in nursing homes that may require um, a very specific plan to take them out of the nursing home to a different place where they might be able to take care of them. Sorry, one more population in case we don't have enough. Uh, the undocumented population I worry quite a bit about because they have tenuous access to healthcare as it is and then very little ability um, to protect themselves when so the undocumented population or unhoused population is the other population that we see um, greatly affected. Th thank you. Yes. Did you want to chime in, Beth? Or do you? Yeah. As, a, as a social scientist, we also talk about social vulnerability and it's different than what the, you know, what health conditions you have that might predispose you. And it gets a little bit more to what Kate was just saying about the social conditions that marginalize you, make you uh, less able to protect yourself from heat or flooding or even just hearing a hurricane warning in advance. In, in New Orleans, that many of the Spanish-speaking residents didn't, there's not very much Spanish or there wasn't very much Spanish language television and radio at the time. And so they were quite isolated from the news and weren't, didn't have the same kind of information and were more subject to misinformation about how to respond to the hurricane warnings. But I wanna talk a little bit about social vulnerability because the CDC has a social vulnerability index that a lot of localities use to plan for emergencies. And there are four components of the four themes in the social vulnerability index that include race, ethnicity, language use, that's one domain. Housing and transportation is another. Um, and okay, now I'm not gonna remember the second two, but it doesn't matter, you can look it up. <laughs> but, the, so, but what we see in many cities like New Orleans is that residential segregation and particularly racial residential segregation of the African-American population of the United States, redlining and historical practices that segregate that population into more vulnerable, environmentally vulnerable areas of a city or region, make that population structurally more vulnerable to disasters. And that's a you know, a, a very clear example of structural racism and how it plays out in disaster vulnerability. Yeah, thank you, Beth, for tying that together for us, right? The social vulnerability index is based on the social determinants of health framework, right? Um, and I think part of why I'm on this panel is because in the Information Futures Lab, we think a lot about information as a social determinants of health. And we can think about Katrina for those, you know, who were around when that happened, um, that there was more propensity for rumors, but it still played out in an, in a world without the iPhone. Whereas today, these disasters just play out in an entirely different information ecosystem. And that impacts people's ability to have access to information that can actually be life-saving at the time or not, right? In, in all ways, in the best possible ways, with really fast, good information, and in the worst possible ways, with really fast, bad information. <laughs> Um, so those are some of the things that we think about at the IFL as to how do we need to and how can we work with communities around these information needs, right? There was a report here in Rhode Island after flooding um, that in identified information challenges as one of the key issues when, like, for example, as simple as reimbursement policies, if your house was damaged by floods, wasn't translated, right? And by translated, we don't just mean language, we mean culturally competent, right? There's so many layers of translation that we want to think about with these types of things. And the other thing that I think you tie, you all tied together real nicely is like, we're constantly going from the acute to the chronic, from the acute to the chronic. And we're doing that both in healthcare and 
we're doing that in disaster response, right? Where it's between preparedness and response, preparedness and response. And we need a better chronic care system in order to be able to deal with the acute events, right? Because like our patients here, they already come vulnerable to the climate event. And that's constantly what we see playing out. So Beth, I'm gonna pop it over to you. Let's talk a little bit um, about the mental health impact of all of this. Yeah, um, so we disaster re researchers have known for a very long time, and it's kind of maybe uh, obvious that disasters affect mental health. They cause post-traumatic stress syndrome, particularly if you've been more exposed to the hazard, or you've had a family member who died, or you've been injured, or you've been in a dangerous situation where you didn't have access to your to water or food or shelter or med or medicine. And so uh, those are all predictors of sort of the post-traumatic stress disorder that disaster exposed people have are likely to have after Hurricane Katrina studies like three months after the disaster found that the levels of mental health of probable mental health and you know mental health disorders were about 50 percent of the population and it was no surprise right that was an incredibly unprecedented and traumatic event um one of the things that we didn't know at the time was how long those symptoms would last and a fun fact for all of you President Paxson, Christina Paxson, was the leader of a study that I was uh, also part of the team. She what, called the Resilience and Survivors of Katrina study. And this was a panel study of low-income African-American women who were enrolled in community college in New Orleans and who all evacuated because of the hurricane. We did a qualitative and a quantitative longitudinal study. The most recent, there were four waves of data collection, most recently in 2019. And five years after the hurricane, uh, that we had the first, uh, you know, the first, or rather the second post-disaster wave of data collection, where we could see the trajectories of mental health in the disaster affected population and what the social characteristics and experiences of the participants were that were predictive of either um, sustained high mental, uh, probable mental illness, declining probable mental illness, increasing probable mental illness, and then people who just had consistently low mental illness. And it was, very interesting to see that it was not just the, what we might expect, that, that people sort of got over it with time. One of the things that led to that increase or high sustained mental illness was what we might call it secondary disaster effects, the migration, the prolonged displacement, the uncertainty around what you should be doing to get on with your life. The, all of those contributed to that high sustained mental illness, which was um, a first and it has been, you know, we've, we've been better able to study these sort of long-term effects of disasters, particularly with administrative data. So we're, we're still learning a lot about it. So, Thank you. Um, so many thoughts on that one, particularly, especially as we know in trauma work, right? You never get over it. It's always about integrating the event into your lived experience overall. And the, the piece about um, uh, the ability to act driving resilience um, and the ability to access healthy living conditions. Um, I'm a journalist by training. I wrote my first flooding story probably 33 years ago in Europe, then we called it climate. Um, but as we're having this conversation, I'm reminded of something we've in journalism struggled with over the past 30 years is how do we tell the climate story and how do we not all get depressed in the process? So we've all heard, you know, 
what research does really well, which is evidence on this is real, it's happening, folks, it's right there. It can be hard to confront, right? Um, especially as, as we see sort of the, the cumulative, um, the, the mountain of the challenge, um, the, the framing around you, you, we can't modify fast enough and how do we protect our health? So would love to hear from each of you um, how you come to that solutions part of the conversation. Like what are some of the things we can do again, both either individually or collectively or in our workplaces? I'm going to start with you, Kate. Yeah, this is a tough one, right? Because we confront it uh, clinically all of the time. And so I think uh, the way that I deal with this um, is that I look for ways that I can contribute to solutions. And once you feel like you're working towards a solution, um, it the problem feels less heavy. Uh, and so I do this in a variety of ways. One is that we work to train physicians and medical students currently um, how to integrate climate change into their education so that they understand the implications of climate change uh, into medicine, to whatever they may go to practice. So right now, uh, at the medical school, we're integrating climate change into each of their uh, um, systems. So they, you know, they don't just learn about climate change as a and then climate change, right? It, it, when they learn about heart disease and heart physiology, they learn about the implications of climate change there. They learn about climate change and the implications of lung physiology and pathology. So it's woven throughout their curriculum, um, which is a new addition uh, at the medical school. And so we're working towards that, which feels very positive and uplifting. And also, um, I feel like younger people are always way more solutions oriented than as we get older, I'm not that old. Um, and then the second way I do it is I've started to learn how to research this and to look at it through more of a researcher's lens. So. Um, Right now, we're looking at the um, EMS utilization across the state of Rhode Island and how that's related to heat and how it's related to urban heat island effects. We're doing this in partnership with disaster management through Providence to look at where we should put additional cooling centers. And then hopefully we're going to look at who's utilizing those cooling centers and who's not utilizing those cooling centers and how do we reach those vulnerable populations. Uh, and so by, by continually taking a solutions-oriented you allow you to kind of continue to confront the problem. Do you also want to talk a bit about the clinical practice? Sure. The other thing that we do, so when I trained in medical school, well, back in the day, <laughs> when I was a resident, um, we had to give a senior lecture and it could be whatever you wanted it to be. And I went to my boss, the head of the residency, and I said, I want to do uh, the implications of climate change on emergency medicine. And this could have happened anywhere. My residency was wonderful. It was a it was a marker of the time. But he laughed. He said that wasn't a thing. There was no way I could do a presentation on this, and that those implications were not real. It was just projections. And how could I do a presentation on projections? And so I did migraine headaches, and it was very boring. Um, and I think that just shows you how far we've come, um, and 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 how quickly. So one of the things that I do clinically now is I change how I interview patients, right? So we're all familiar with how we interview about the risk factors of smoking. Like, do you smoke? You know, you shouldn't smoke, blah, 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 blah. There's a whole science behind it. But now I also do a climate change assessment or a climate risks assessment with my patients. So you come in for an asthma exacerbation and not, I don't just say, you know, use your inhalers. I say, what setting do you live in? Do you live next to a highway? Or you come in with anxiety, really bad anxiety, and I want you to go outside and walk every day in the sun to help with your anxiety management. Well, I, I assess if that's safe. You know, do you live by a highway? Do you have a history of asthma? What are the temperatures? And then we screen for, do you need to be given resources for cooling centers and those sorts of things? Unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult, right? Because the resources that I have to give patients still feel quite limited, right? People can't move away from the highway. Um, but it's the first step in the right direction, and it starts to have start that conversation um, and that integration of climate change into the clinical uh, environment. So, um, as I mentioned before, one of the uh, the uh, you know findings that I um, found very interesting in Puerto Rico was uh, this 
preparar the group that they have, the Emergency Preparedness Coalition, that is dedicated to um, understand the the you know the these events and the effect of these events for people with um, kidney conditions. Um, this group, um, uh, members of these groups include the federal, the local government, nonprofit organizations, everyone that has something that is related to patients with kidney failure. And I found that fascinated. So they meet regularly. They talk about earthquakes. They talk about hurricanes. Um, they did mention that they were prepared for hurricanes, but they were not prepared for a Maria type of level hurricane. So um, there were some lessons that were learned there and they discussed it on a regular basis. So, um, I, you know, I would like to see this expanded for other groups, not necessarily just the kidney failure population, right? Because we know that they are, there is already, you know, they are already labeled as a, as a, as a population that needs care and they have a group dedicated to make sure that they have access to the, the care that they need. Uh, but what about the others that don't have that type of, you know, of uh, follow-up? Um, so um, having some of these directories perhaps will be beneficial for other patients, like, you know, patients that are labeled as complex that may be um, able to contact once the, or not during the, before and during the event to make sure that they are safe and what we need to do to make sure that they're safe uh, for them and see if there's as groups are, um, you know, in other parts of the, the US. I was not familiar with the Rhode Island Emergency Preparedness Group. Uh, uh, so um, it would be, you know, it would be something that, that I would like to see just that have these coalitions to start having that conversation about all of these events that are happening for in the, you know, in the impact that they can cause on uh, in these populations. So I have a personal and professional perspective on this question of like, how do you cope? <laughs> and um, one of the things that having lived in New Orleans at the time of Hurricane Katrina, I love, I love New Orleans. New Orleans is an amazing city and you wouldn't know it from being a tourist because what, uh, it's a city of neighborhoods where people really live outside. They're very socially connected. And all of the Mardi Gras parades, those are clubs that are that meet throughout the year. Those people are connected. They hang out together. They help each other. They're called social aid and pleasure clubs, and that's what they are. And every city should have them <laughs> because they're really they're really critical. Um, but but when I was living there before the hurricane, I often felt like an outsider because I was you know, an assistant professor trying to get tenure. I didn't have time to go to all those parties. And, and so I didn't necessarily feel as connected to people as I would have liked. And um, after Hurricane Katrina, granted, we were all displaced for some time, but we actually were displaced together. And I suddenly had a group of best friends who we all, you know, evacuated together and we helped each other out. And then when we came back to the city, we did the same thing. Um, Rebecca Solnit has a book called Paradise Built in Hell about exactly this phenomenon of post-disaster disaster communities that come together, help each other out. And I think New Orleans, because of its already existing social infrastructure, was particularly primed to really be helpful to in rebuilding the city, insofar as people had the resources. I mean, there were some very real limits on what you could do, but that social infrastructure was there. And I just want to say that I think for me that understanding that not only was that my lived experience, but it's a more general phenomenon that people come together to help each other out and that disasters bring people together hopefully in enduring ways um, that would persist well beyond the recovery period. And I would hope that people could do the same thing around climate change. If we all can recognize climate change as an emergency and can come together to uh, prepare and help each other out in the sort of social aid and pleasure club manner, that could be an amazing thing. I'm not sure that 
anybody's caught on to that yet, but I do actually know from a panel that I went to yesterday at RISD that there are artists in, the, in Providence who are doing exactly that. They're using art to co form collectives raise consciousness, raise awareness of climate change, the climate change emergency, and, um, and get people galvanized around this topic. So that sort of um, personal experience has definitely corresponds <coughs> to what I've seen uh, it, as a real uh, social function that people are rising to the occasion. Thank you all. So let's go to questions from the audience. Who would like to ask? Question. Thank you. I, I had a question going back when there was a comment about mental health, and I was really wondering whether how that uh, divides, uh, how that um, articulates through age groups. And in particular, I, I'm curious to know whether with the climate crisis and so many youth organizations that are taking part, even on our own campus, of whether that is also reflective of uh, mental health issues among the young. Yeah, I think climate grief is real and it's different than uh, disaster exposure, right? It, it, it has it, a different mechanism for onset. But in a disaster, there, the, what we've found with um, the sort of age profile of mental health issues after disaster exposure Older people are quite resilient in terms of their mental health. Their life experiences often prepare them for the sort of things that they've seen, that they might have experienced during a disaster. And so they have more mental res resources to cope with it and maybe stronger social networks as well. And younger people are much less able to sort of, they don't have those tools in their mental health toolkit yet. Um, there's an excellent study by a colleague of mine who used the American Community Survey data to look at disability in the Katrina affected population of New Orleans. And what he shows is that um, compared to pre-Katrina, the pre-Katrina population, the groups that were most likely to report a uh, disability after Hurricane Katrina were African-American women between the ages of 25 and 44. And um, he didn't have a whole, you know, there aren't a whole lot of covariates in this data that you could use to identify other, you know, causes other than, you know, the sort of demographic, the age, race, sex profile. But it was quite um, interesting because it corresponded to the risk study that I referred to earlier, where we were looking at low-income African-American women who were mothers, and where they talked about all of the stressors that they had to uh, cope with taking care of their children, often with you know, few resources, being very dependent on family members, who were dispersed or might have died in the event. And so it was just um, that demographic perspective on who was most impacted by that event was really suggestive of some of the, the mechanisms at work for an acute disaster exposure. The climate grief, I, I can't speak to, but I think people are studying it now and it's an important topic. Yeah, and I can tell you that there's actually this is a growing issue in journalism as well. That for journalists who've covered this for a long time, they've run into significant mental health problems. And part of my work is on uh, trauma journalism and how journalists both recover from trauma, but also how do we cover traumatic events in ways both that are respectful to those that are affected, but also in not repeating cliches about trauma and everything else. So it's a real thing. Did either of you want to respond to the question? You good? Who else has a question? So when I think about um, disaster relief and I think about how the government responds to it and there are different levels, right? There's sort of a, a state level and then a federal level. 
Are there any states that are sort of role models of who responds? Because so often when I'm watching TV and listening to this, immediately it jumps up many times the federal government. So I just wonder how the state responses are. I can, um, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but I've learned something about it along the way. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the way a disaster declaration is made, it comes, a, a, the governor of a state asks the president for a, a disaster declaration. And once that request is made, then federal resources f flow toward the states, toward the disaster affected counties. And, um, and those federal monies are typically managed by states. And so the state sets up a, a program to distribute those funds according to their own sort of priorities. And, um, and so that can lead to unevenness across states in terms of how disaster, disaster recovery dollars are, are distributed. Um, I don't know that there's any state that's a particular leader, but if I were to venture a guess, I would say it would be Florida. And Florida has there has not only relies on federal money, but they have implemented some state level insurance policies and building codes and other types of adaptations so that they can harden the built environment against the hurricanes that they experience regularly. So I've woven most of the audience question that we received prior into, do we have one more? Thank you all very much. Uh, Kate, I'm gonna start with you on this question. <clears throat> you brought out a couple of things that were pretty interesting. One in particular was around how you said that um, you're incorporating sort of climate and health and to, to, to medical school training and maybe into the residency as well. Um, and how do you, how do you, because we're always kind of thinking about sort of modifying curricula as well. How do, you, how do you make a decision about what not to do? Because the argument is always, there's so many things we have to teach that we can do everything. So how do you figure out uh, how to prioritize uh, climate and health is it at the expense of something else or are you short? I mean, what, how are you, how are you approaching <coughs> that? Because there's so much that you, it seems like there's more and more that you have to cram into a curriculum these days. And so how do you make those decisions? So, yeah, it's challenging, right? Time is our most valuable resource. Uh, I think by weaving it in, right, the lessons are not complicated. They're just widespread. So climate change touches on everything. And so if you, you, if you treat climate change as its own thing, at least within medicine, as you treat it as like, okay, now we're gonna do the climate change week, right? right? Then it takes a week of time. But to weave in climate change into all of the different teachings and into all of the different aspects, it actually doesn't displace much at all because those lessons are fairly quick. You can also integrate it into curriculum that already exists. And so, for example, um, you're doing oral board style cases. So this would be, you know, I give you a patient presentation and, and students have to think through a differential, i.e. what are all the things that could be causing it and what are the managements that we would want to do all of the medicines. They already are doing those cases. It's very easy to implement one of those cases with a climate change focus or adding that as an aspect to that case. So once you treat climate change not as an other, but as a, this needs to be part of everything, it integrates into what's already there. And it actually ends up giving them way more climate change exposure, but without um, subtracting, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. and. Also is about, even if we take the word climate change out and just think about how do I stay healthy, right? Then we get to the same outcome because people come through your door regardless of what we call it. Right. And it's so important. I mean, nobody argued, oh, there's too much medicine curriculum. We can't treat about COVID, right? There's too much. COVID's just, sorry, keep it out, right? Like that's not an option. 
and so we can't change climate change that way. This is so important. It needs to be a part of everything. Fantastic. So final question from a reporter. You have 30 seconds for the answer. What is one tangible change we could make today? You can pick your unit, unit, individual change, change in the hospital, change in how we do the research, changes at the city or state level, anything that we could make today that will put us in a better place. We have to address the affordable housing crisis. And people can't be healthy if they aren't living in healthy homes. And so that would, as a social scientist, that would be my number one priority. Of course, it's a, not easy. So fixing the chronic so we're better with the acute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I was interested in doing research related to Puerto Rico then I encountered Maria and overlap at the same time with what I was doing. At the same time, the um, NIMHD, the National Institute of uh, Health Disparities, released a proposal that they were interested in understanding the long-term effects of natural disasters uh, and the impact on um, health. I don't think I have seen um, calls for proposals that were related to health and climate events. Uh, and health services research. So, um, you know, if, if, if we want to do research uh, that I relate to, you know, the impact of these natural disasters um, on health, then we need the resources for the federal government and, you know, and other organizations to provide the funds to be able to, you know, do such a research. So um, it, it was very interesting that I all kind of fell in place for what I was doing. And since then I have talked to other um, colleagues that are very interested in understanding some other events using similar data that we have and, and now it's bringing more collaborations to continue doing this kind of research. So I'll build off of the Dean's question. And when I looked through who was attending this, this panel discussion, it looked like a lot of professors and students that go here to the School of Public Health. So here's my one change. If you're a professor, integrate climate change into one question, one teaching, one lecture, one slide, I don't care, one of anything in your course. So I got my master's here not that long ago. You could integrate it into epidemiology, do a biostats question that touches on this. One thing, if you're a student, ask for it. Ask your professors for one change. Ask how does climate change affect this epidemiology subject? One thing within each lecture, that's your job. No better way to end this panel. Let's give a round of applause.